and we are recording. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today and welcome to our Manufacturing Month celebration for Webco Plastics. We are thrilled to be able to take this virtually and reach the more people this year beyond what we may have just been able to have in the shop. And today I have with me a couple of our colleagues as well as close friends of mine to discuss culture and how it affects our workplace and how we can embrace and empower soldiers for our culture. So I'm gonna start off by letting Monica Perez introduce herself and she's from the Connecticut Center for Advanced Technology. Hey everybody. Um, so yes, I am Monica Perez. I am the Workforce Program Specialist at Connecticut Center for Advanced Technology. And we also have Rachel, who is from the American Mold Builders Association, and Ashley from the Manufacturers Association for Plastic Processors. Ladies, do you want to go and tell us just a little bit about your roles? Sure. Um, so as Amanda said, my name is Rachel Fenninger. I'm the Director of Strategic Execution for um, the American Mold Builders Association. Um, and in addition to a lot of our workforce development efforts, our benchmarking, um, and some of the events that we put together in terms of peer-to-peer -peer connections, I also run our Emerging Leaders Network, um, which is for up-and-coming professionals in the mold manufacturing industry. And then I am Ashley Terrell. I'm with the Manufacturers Association of Plastics Processors, otherwise known as MAP. And I am the Membership and Analytics Director over there. Uh, one of the things I have the great privilege of doing is putting on events and going to visit members and having meetings with members now virtually and hearing a lot of their stories um, along with doing a ton of our benchmarking and, and our young professionals group. Thank you so much. And we are so pleased to have all three of you here. So the reason that I picked you three is that Monica does work with us through CCAT and also through a grant that WebCo received from the National Fund for Workforce Solutions. And we began really working on our culture journey about three years ago. And that also got kicked off through Troy Nix, who is the executive director for both the AMBA and MAP. He spoke at an event that Westminster Tool had at their plant about three years ago. And one thing that Troy said that I did not understand then nor truly embrace was that we had to empower soldiers for our culture, which is our topic for today. And Monica, do you mind telling, sharing just a little bit about the grant and what we are working on at WEPCO? Sure, so the grant, um, as Amanda said, is from the National Fund for Workforce Solutions and then Workforce Solutions of Metro Hartford and through our Advanced Manufacturing Employer Partnership. So WEPCO was selected just through um, obviously the partnerships and stuff and the work that they wanted to do. So with that, we really just met WEPCO where they were. We um, kind of, I came in and really just talked about goals as a company and then really just took, um, just started with that employee voice. So really looking at that culture and trying to figure out, you know, where the company and the um, president and, you know, David and everybody wanted to be, but then also where the employees were, where they thought they were and stuff. So really just, you know, meeting you guys where you were and the fact of, you know, you knew you wanted to work on your culture, but what did that look like? So really kind of helping, you know, you and the team and everybody really sit down and look at, you know, what culture did you want? What, you know, what was Webco? What, what did we want? What message did we want to get out? So really just working around that and, you know, with that, the job quality piece and making sure that, you know, everybody was included in this and just making a better place for, you know, everybody to be and be happy and want to stay in. And I think an important part there for us was understanding what culture was and kind of defining it at Webco. So I'm going to throw the three of you in the hot seat for a minute. And Ashley, I'm going to let you start off. How would you define culture? So when you first posed this question to me, I was very, uh, it kind of threw me for a loop because it's one of those things that people just say all the time, right? Oh, we're working on our culture. We have a great culture. Um, we're in general, um, I think sometimes it gets lost in, oh, we have pizza parties or we have, or we, you know, we need to have, you know, ping pong tables in the break room or something like that, where when I think about culture, it's more about how employees feel about going into work and how they feel when they leave work and, and the, how empowered they feel while they're there to get good work done. And so it's less about, um, well, I think a lot of those external things are really important for me when I think about culture and how I would define it is really how employees feel while they're, while they're there and how they feel about their work. And if they feel positive about it, if they're happy to come in, if they're excited about what they're going to do, then I think you're on your path to having a really great culture. 
Now, if you have a whole bunch of people who are dreading coming into work, I think you're on a path to of a dangerous path of having a culture that could end up being toxic. So in my mind, it's really that uh, it's more of a, an emotional feeling um, from the people who come in every single day and get the job done. I love that. I think that's a really, a really great explanation. What about you, Rachel? How would you define culture? Um, so when you initially posed this question, I was in the same place that Ashley was. It was a really difficult I was like, gosh, I don't know. Like it feels, it feels like such an intangible thing, but the more that I thought about it, to me, culture really represents the team dynamic that you have. So I started thinking about, okay, well, what does culture look like to me? And I thought about, there was a time where, where our team members were traveling for an event and our executive director was teasing me because I looked like a dork because I was trying to get all my steps in before getting on a flight. And then there was another time where we were celebrating, it was an employee's uh, five-year work anniversary, and I was in the middle of working on a project, and, um, and he, he was like, Rachel, you need to come out of your office right away, this is urgent, and he forced me into this room to help write a poem that we then sang to our coworker, and she was just overjoyed, and it, it meant so much to her. And, and I think that that's why it boils down to that term, that team dynamic, because it's all about how you're making your employees feel. It has to be, for culture to be really great, it has to start at the top. And I think that the effort has to be not only genuine, but also continuous. It has to be, it has to be a priority that everyone buys into. But the really cool thing about culture and what I think some people realize really well and what others don't is that your culture can then impact your company agenda. Because if you get everyone on the same page and you build that trust on a personal level, then you turn it into something that you just have the buy-in when you say, okay, guys, this is our priority, not just on a personal level, but on a professional level, these are the goals that we're trying to attain. Then everyone's on the same page and they say, I'm with you because you've been there for me. I'm going to be there for you. And I think that what's really cool about that is it also means that that employee becomes empowered. They feel like they're part of the process. They feel like they're part of the decision. Um, and, and it kind of, it all comes back around, right? And it's really easy to let your culture go, which is why I say it's something that you have to just continue to work on and continue to make a priority. Rachel, I love the, the statement where you said that culture has to be continuous, right? It's a continuous effort. I think that this year put a strain on a lot of people because, you know, everybody knows that when things start to go off plan, that sometimes you, people focus more on the fighting fires and that aspect of things and it ends up leaving the personal aspect behind. And the next thing they know, then they're now they're wondering why their culture is in the gutter. It was great six months ago. And now, you know, now what happened? So that I love that you mentioned it being a continuous effort all the time over and over again. Um, it's not just say, we're going to focus on improving our culture this week. And then next week, we're going to do something else. Mm -hmm. I think that's very descriptive of where we are at Webco right now. Unfortunately, COVID hit in March and we had to find a way to make sure that our business could be sustainable, that we could continue to keep the lights on and pay paychecks and a really uncertain economy. And we put a lot of the hard work that Monica and I had done over the past several years on the back burner. We walked in the shop one day, kind of went, what happened to our culture? Monica's sitting there going, well, you know, you put it on the back burner. What did you think was going to happen? So it, it's something that I think we have to be so conscious about every day in our work environments. And that's what really spoke to me recently about what Troy shared about having soldiers for our culture is that I now have team members that will come up to me and say, you know, such and such happened. And I just, I really don't think it fits with our culture. I don't think it fits with our core values or where we're headed. And that is such a powerful thing to me that they feel one empowered to be able to speak up but they also care that much about the culture that we helped build, that they want to protect it. And Rachel, I'd love to hear a little bit about the culture that you guys have at First Resource, because I know you have a similar atmosphere where you guys are so engaged in it and supporting each other through it. Yeah, it's, um, it's really cool. You know, we, I, I mentioned it and you just mentioned it now, the whole concept of employee empowerment. And I think that we're all really fortunate as something that Ashley and Monica were, were talking about earlier before this call, 
was this whole concept that when you work at a small company, there's not necessarily a ladder, but that doesn't mean that you can't grow professionally. And I think first resource culture is all based on this concept of, you know, our managers or, and our executive director is always asking us, where do you want to go and how can I help you get there? What do you want to be doing? What don't you want to be doing? Obviously, everyone has things in their job that they're like, oh, I really don't want to do this today. But, but that's not the kind of stuff I'm talking about. It's, it's talking about what your pathway looks like and what that journey is and feeling empowered to speak up and say, this is where I want to go. This is what I'm passionate about. Um, you know, our company is interesting because we have several generations at it and um, it has uh, created many interesting conversations, <laughs> some of which relate in various ways to culture and development. Um, but I think that the really cool thing is that we're always open to new ideas. And again, it starts at the top, right? And it requires openness to those ideas and an encouragement, not only to go for them, but also acceptance if you fail. Not everything is going to succeed. We're all going to fall on our face sometimes. So you want to feel like you are in this, you have a safety net a little bit from your management team. And so that's something that, you know, it, and I try it, it's again, it's going back to the whole concept of trust because that, because of that interest from our management team, because of the constant desire to help you grow outward, <laughs> if not upward, um, you, you feel, you feel safe in expressing the things that you want to do and the things that you want to try pushing for them and then being okay with it, whether they succeed, you know, or fail. And I think that's so important. And um, when I was kind of thinking about what culture meant to me and everything that it's funny that you say that because it's everything that everyone has said so far just goes back into kind of what I was thinking and the fact of, you know, even just the definition of culture, like when you, you know, Google it and everything like that, and then really thinking about what a company could do. So in all reality, like a company, the culture is what's between those four walls and then what you obviously exude outside of those four walls. So, you know, how you people associate with your company and things like that. But I think the big thing is, and it goes back to a lot of um, the work that we are doing at Webco and just the job quality piece and just really taking care of your own people is, you know, really setting those expectations, those values, those goals, the um, setting those acceptable norms. So like you were saying in the fact of, you know, um, you know, the different things that came out, it didn't surprise you because it was, it was a norm for you guys. So I think sometimes, you know, when you set these standards and set these things that you want in your culture, then people aren't surprised when something happens. So you're like, you know, that's in our culture. But then when something comes in and attacks that culture and you have those soldiers that want to stand up and, you know, fight for it, it's like, whoa, 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 this isn't one of our norms. We don't know how to react to this. And I think you were, I think Rachel, you said it in the fact that, you know, we should always be open to ideas and how to, again, using that employee voice on how to, um, improve things if something in the culture seems a little off or if something seems a little weird like okay let's come back to the table and if you feel like that one value or a norm that you have or whatever is being attacked okay let's come to the table set up a focus group set up a okay if you're a small company let's just sit down let's talk through this okay this is what happened what can we do to stop it from happening so I think really just setting those expectations that you know you should be surprised when something's outside of those expectations hopefully you shouldn't be surprised on those like good fun things that you're doing so like this is part of our culture this is what we do so one of the things Rachel and I actually work in the same office while we focus on different organizations we do work together um, and when Rachel was mentioning um, the idea that it's more about just, it's not just what are you doing every day? It's this whole kind of idea of where do you want to, where do you see yourself? What do you want to do? And even in our annual reviews, one of the questions that we get asked is not only where do you want to go professionally, but what can the company do for you to help you personally? What are your personal goals that the help can, the company can then help you achieve? And obviously those are different for every single person. And this idea of like trust and transparency comes in a huge, um, and a huge level for that. Um, and I will, and the, I think Rachel and probably Amanda can attest that uh, at our organization, we try to be, have a very transparent culture, sometimes maybe too transparent when we're interacting <laughs> with one another. Um, but I have no problem, you know, going to, um, you know, Troy and saying, hey, this happened and I didn't, that didn't feel right. I don't know if that's the right decision. Just like Rachel has come to me and said, hey, I don't know if that's the right decision when we've been brainstorming ideas or we've had, you know, different uh, differences of opinion. I think being able, knowing that you can go and talk to somebody and not have it be, oh, well, uh, not have it blow up or have it be bigger than it is. It's like, let's just talk about this. What yeah. is it? And get it off the, out of the table. So that way it's not a looming issue that 
slowly eats away at, you know, your trust in somebody. And especially when you're a small organization, this, the overall culture and self. And I think too, that I, I love how you say that, because I think, you know, you do get come in some places and culture can go one of two ways. You know, this can be this great culture that everybody, but then if you, you need a culture that's ever changing as well and growing with your company and your workforce. And again, just revisiting that employee voice, because you can walk into a shop sometimes and it's like, you know, well, let's do this. Well, that's not what we do here. Or we don't do that here. Or we don't want to hear that here. And it's like, wait, what are we working at the same place? So I think that big thing, it's a mind shift as well for those that have been in there forever and just having that. And I think that's something you embed in your culture that, you know, Amanda and I talk about this is a continuous improvement. It doesn't mean for your product or for that side of things. It's about your workforce, you know, everybody in there, like, how do we keep that, set that into your culture and the fact of, you know, we do do that here. We don't, put people down we don't think you know we don't make it transparent we don't make it this or that but I think that you know there can be two ways that companies do hold on to culture and some of it can be very negative and it can be very um, detrimental to the workforce and that's why retention and turnover attrition you know all that stuff does happen so I think it's really important for you know kind of like you said start at the top and really figure out you know what you want and then make sure it trickles down in the positive right way and Monica I like the you keep talking about this employee voice and um, one of the things that we've seen some manufacturers do is to make sure that they not, we see some, a lot of places, suggestion boxes, right? And while the concept is great, it's really about what happens after the suggestion yes. comes in. That's like more important. Um, and so we had a, we had a member who said that they put in a suggestion box and nobody was doing anything with it. So it was totally useless. Um, until they decided that until they realized that people were, had put one or two things in there and then nobody ever did anything about it. There was no follow-up to it. And so that just seemed more like a prop than something that was part of their, what they're part of their mission or actually trying to hear the employees. And so um, they started actually having meetings and saying, these are the, what we've gotten so far. These ones, there's not necessarily bad suggestions. These ones we, we are not able to do at this time for right. you know, budget reasons, resources, et cetera. But here are the ideas that we can do. And thank you so much, Monica, for, and for you know, putting that in there. And here's a gift card for gas, or here's a gift card for Starbucks or whatever. Thank you so much. And they did it in their, um, in their morning meetings. So everybody got to see it. And then they got to see the change get implemented. So it wasn't, it was no longer a prop. It became a tool for people to uh, start to, you know, put out their feelings and their voices more and more and more. And that's something that like, when it comes to a continuous standpoint, it had to be something that they worked on over and over and over again, before right. people really trusted that their voice was going to be heard. And that's what I see in a lot of just with the job quality work and stuff too. And I see that in a lot of employers when I go out and I am that person of the employee voice and they, you know, I'm like, let's do a, I always like to start off with a survey or let's do this or whatever, but, and Amanda knows this and, you know, we, that's something that we have implemented now in the culture that we want to hear your voice. But I always tell employers, and it's so true that you say that actually, in the fact that, you know, you can you can do stuff and do stuff and do stuff. So say that you keep doing something, but you're not seeing results just as a human. That's how we are. Like, okay, they're not listening to me. They don't want to know my opinion. I'm done. They might stay at the position that they're doing or the work that they're doing. They like what they're doing, but it's like, they're just not heard. So after so often of asking, you're going to stop. So I always tell employers, I said, you know, do you do a survey? Yes or no kind of thing. And then if you have done it, what do you do with it? If you haven't done one yet, you have got to be prepared once you get that feedback back that you have to act, you have to respond. And Amanda and I really had, you know, that tough conversation of, you know, once we broke down the responses and stuff, it's kind of like, oh, wow, here it is. And I have to tell Amanda that, you know, even with culture, even with improvements, even with whatever that you're doing, it takes time. So actually, I like how you said that, you know, you you have things that this is what we can do right now. This is going to be a long-term goal, but you telling your employees that we heard you, we get it, we see it, help us try to get to that end solution. So embedding that in your culture is so important that now, like you said, that trust that, you know, that feeling that you have that like, okay, they're actually listening. But if you have in the past done this and then you don't react and you have the suggestion box that's growing, you know, um, dust on top of it that nobody checks, then you have to rebuild that trust. You have to reset that culture. You have to be, let this now become your new norm. And I tell employers that all the time. And I've had employers be honest with me and say, Monica, I don't think we're ready. And I said, okay, well, let's take a step back. What can we do? You know, can we do a focus group and start on something smaller? We don't have to do this huge, you know, 
crazy survey or whatever, but what can we do? Where can we start? And I think that's the first step is even acknowledging that I don't think we're at a spot right now where we can respond. And I think it's so important in the culture that you set that you're going to respond when you are asking for something because people are going to stop telling you. Well, and Monica, I want to go back to, to what you said earlier, you touched on retention of your workforce. And I think that also leads into kind of the Webco story, Amanda, that, that you might share some of, but it's really, it is the top challenge facing our industry today. And it is the top question I get asked constantly by every member. We have a workforce development problem. How can you help me? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that this is, I think that this topic, what we're talking about right now, is if you have a workforce retention or recruitment problem, then your culture is probably the first place to start. It's well documented that the newer generations of workers that are coming into the workforce really feel strongly they're not necessarily motivated by wealth. They're not necessarily motivated by titles. They're not afraid to work hard, but what they want is they want a voice from the start. They want buy-in. They want to be responsible for the goal. They want to be responsible for what happens to the bottom line at the company. And so if you are having trouble getting people to work for you, then it probably is because they feel like they're not going to have that. Or it's because they don't understand that that's what you want too. So you should try and communicate to that, that to them. And I think just some of what Amanda has shared to me about the age of your guys' workforce and some of our members who do have a younger workforce, I think that their culture is one of the paramount things that they're working on. And I, I just truly believe that those two things are tied directly together. And Rachel, Absolutely. I... I would agree with you as well. And you see, uh, you mentioned it earlier that the culture starts at the top, right? And so you'll sometimes hear, you know, business leaders complain about their culture, but really you're the ones who, who have control over it. You're the ones who have to make the move and make the, to make that initiative and continue to go out on the floor and meet your people and talk to people and hear their ideas and take action on those ideas and genuinely care about people. Cause you're right, the younger generation um, does want to somewhere where they feel like they are cared about and that people and that they matter. And so if you walk and you can feel that when you walk into any shop, you know, any mold making shop, any, you know, processing shop, when you walk in, you can feel are the people are the people on the floor, are they averting their eyes? Are they not trying to look at you when they walk by? Or are they, you know, are they, you know, shaking hands and saying, well, not right now, but are they yeah. saying hello? <laughs> elbow bumps. Elbow bumps. <laughs> yeah. Are they elbow bumping, you know? you feel that when you walk in places and you can tell almost immediately. So yeah, when you have, if you're looking to recruit people and you're trying to bring them in and they walk in, they just see everybody there. Who's kind of like shying away from like the senior leadership or they're not noticing a lot of celebrations about the people there. Um, they're going to notice that and they're probably going to look somewhere else. And I think I, yes, 100%. And I think in Amanda and I, we talk about this all the time as well is, so it starts at the top and you're building this culture and you're, you know, trying to do this thing. And so say you're walking through the shop doing the elbow bumps or whatever, but then if you have somebody on your leadership team that doesn't see eye to eye with you, like you almost have to stop from the, start from the top and come down in the fact of, okay, who do I have in what seat? Are they in the right seats? Because that can be horrible for your culture. You know, I've talked to a lot of companies and, you know, you might have that one bad apple. They're one heck of a worker and they do anything you ask them, but they just exude that just like negativity, like, oh, here we go again, just talking horribly. And you got to think to yourself, this isn't the culture that we're trying to set up. We can give them all the tools and the fact of like, hey, this is what we're doing. We need you on board. So I think just having the right people in the right seat and sending off the same message because people unfortunately as humans we tend to look at the bad things and we forget about all the good things so you can walk through and see this beautiful place like the best equipment ever and then if the people are in bad moods rude and then you just have that one like you were just like oh my gosh this was amazing the culture is amazing they have that one person they're like give me your paperwork you know what i'm saying like they're just so <laughs> like and we all have our days i get it but setting up that culture and just having everybody has to be part of it and again like Amanda going back to that thing that you have to have people that want to fight for it like hey no you know this is what we're doing we don't need that You're like we can't do that here like now saying that part, that's not part of our culture so I think that it's so important that retention piece and you know recruiting people and just people see it and people can tell when people are genuine or not 
So I think especially in our industry, that's a, it's a hard shift because Rachel will tell you is mold builders. We want to put our heads down and we want to build that next mold. And we have a guy in the shop that says he wants to knock it out of the park every time. <laughs> he wants to focus on building those molds and getting them out as quickly as possible. But in able to do that, you need a team surrounding you that wants to do that. And he's been with us, I think, about five years now. And it was a huge shift for him when we started going, hey, when you come in in the shop in the morning, go fist bump them, ask them how their weekend was. And he would go, man, do I really have to do that? Right. He goes, I really just want to get the CNC machine going. And I go, yes, you need to do that. Go, go ask them, go find out what they did. Did he work on his car? Did this one go to the movies? You know, what did, what did they do? And he now has the best team that we have in the entire shop because he started with one small thing about taking an interest in them and they turned around and they do great work for him. He leaves the list on the day he's out of the office and they do more. They exceed that list because he started with building that bridge and getting to know them and making that relationship a part of their, a part of their culture. And I think as manufacturers, it's especially hard for us to step away from what we're making and look at the team who's making it for us and putting value there. And that's why I always have to remind, you know, when I am working with employers and stuff and the fact that I get it, I 100% understand that you have a product, you have customers, you have stuff that needs to be out that door. But if you don't have people there to do it and it's going out not to your standard or to their standard, you're not going to get anywhere. So let's take a step back and be like, okay, we still have to do a job. We still have to do this. We don't have to all hug and, you know, let's have a powwow, but let's figure it out. Let's find a way that, you know, and I think Amanda and I had this conversation earlier too, is that, you know, when you, you know, get that culture to where it's just so inclusive and just everybody wants to be there. And then they now start to understand, okay, this is for the customer. And then this needs to be looking the, the best part that needs to go out the door. So they really just start to, you know, get those other skills. They're wanting to learn, they're wanting to grow, they're wanting to build those, you know, um, you know, if you have a skills matrix, they want to, you know, learn all those skills on that. So I think that it's so important that you if you're setting that foundation, then I just think the growth comes. And then at the end of the day, you know, you have more customers because they see your culture. They want to be part of it. They want to be, um, they be in on the, the good stuff, I guess. Mm-hmm. And Monica, going back a little bit to what you said about having that one employee who, who maybe, who can ruin it for, you know, especially, you know, depending on your company size, they can really end up being that bad apple that, you know, spoils a whole bunch. We actually had um, a company recently who had, they had a, um, a, someone, great person in a fairly senior role, um, did a great job, was one of the, his, at his job, he was awesome. A situation came up and it completely obliterated, you know, one of their core values. And so he had a choice, you know, the company owner had a choice and he ended up letting that person go. He's like, this person was very, as very close to them. We worked together for years and he did a great job for me, but in this situation, I can't, I can't look my employees in my, in the eye and tell them that they need to do all these things and they need to be courageous. They need to make the tough decisions. They need to work harder and do everything else. If I can't do the same. And by getting rid of that one person, it showed the rest of the team. Like I mean it when I say that we're here for this and that these are our values and this is what we're doing. I mean it. And I'm willing to take the risk and I want you here with me to do it. So I think having the courage to make those tough decisions or have tough conversations with people who maybe aren't on board yet is, is really critical to building up that culture um, all around you. Cause that's how you're going to have the soldiers is when they know that, you know, you're willing to fight for them. So they're going to fight for you too. That's so important. It's so important, Ashley. And I, th- and I've seen situations too, like that, where the leader or management team didn't make that decision and they let that person stay. And I've seen companies where over half of the workforce left. Because they were like, I don't, I just don't want to work here anymore. The The management team isn't seeing us. They're not, because it, it, you think that, okay, by not making a decision, I've just decided personally, I'm going to let this one go. And you think you're doing something good for the company, but you don't realize that you're really harming, what you're harming is your relationships with the other employees. And ultimately you're killing the trust that you need. And that's the trust that allows you to then work on, to your point, Amanda, to work on the company agenda or for a department to run well or for everyone to focus on an objective. It just makes everyone not, not that interested. It's so, it's so important for leadership to take that step. And I've seen a lot of leaders that don't, they don't really realize that at first. And I think that it's, it's funny. And uh, we talk about this too. And 
just the, the title of the soldier piece. So I am in the military, um, not a soldier, but a, um, a airman. So, but it's so funny that you're talking about that culture. Like we had leadership at one point that was just, they didn't listen to us. They didn't see us. It was their agenda. It was what it was. And yeah, we're in a bigger picture of stuff. And I think that, you know, we in the military even do cultural surveys. They're pushing it out. Like we want to hear, it goes directly to the commander. It goes directly to this person. So, you know, we're a small unit and, you know, we always say that we need to have each other six. When we're going out somewhere, we need to make sure we have each other. I don't want to go out into the field somewhere and know that we have a bad apple in here. Somebody that doesn't love us as a family or, you know, our brothers and sisters and, you know, all this stuff and companies are no different. And I think that that's so important and people think well we're manufacturing or we're hospitality or we're this it's it's everywhere it is everybody needs a culture that's inclusive and that you know you're really looking out even for your bottom person from the top to the bottom there should be that continuous um just everybody on the same page and supporting the greater good of whatever you're working towards so i think it's just so it, it, you're just so right in the fact of you know just that leadership can make or break and you know people want out, you know, they are like, when am I done? When can I finish this? When can I find my next, my next move? So I think it's so, so true. And Ebony commented here that I believe it's very important for management to see their employees and to grow trust within their organization. I could not agree more. Ashley, what have you seen in within the members of math as some of the ways that, you know, molders are building trust with their team? So what I've seen a lot of is, um, First, you know, obviously the leadership portion. So once you have this leadership on board and everybody's ready to change and to, you know, build that trust, they've started to go into smaller groups, right? So now you're going to find those people who you kind of already know are the rock stars, right? You already, they, you know that they're going to be part of the culture. Maybe they're not part of the leadership team, but you know, they're, uh, they're on the floor and you know that they're into it. And so then they brought them together to do smaller things. Like they'll have like culture committees where they're in charge of, you know, getting people together and organizing people We've had people um, a couple of years ago at the math conference, we, um, we had David Horsinger who wrote, who wrote uh, The Trust Edge. He was our keynote speaker. And after that, we had people who bought the book, The Trust Edge, and they actually sat down and, you know, during their lunch and during their own time and went through the book and did a book, like a book study with it and talked through like the different levels of trust and saying, you know, where do I, you know, there's eight pillars, you know, which pillars do I, where am I at with everybody else? And where do I think people are at with me? And then how do I need to build that up? So if I'm looking across the aisle and I know that I think that Amanda is compassionate and caring and competent, but I'm not sure that, you know, I have this, I'm missing this one piece of trust with her. I need to go to her and I need to talk to her about it. I need to build this relationship. Maybe we just need to have lunch because maybe I just don't know. I don't understand enough about what she's doing. So having the ability to, you know, go in and actually um, evaluate where you are with other people and where you think other people are with you. And then being receptive, and you know, being receptive to hearing the hearing that feedback, um, I think is the number one way that people can start to build that trust. And Monica touched on it earlier. If you're not gonna, if you're not gonna be willing to hear some of the, as a leader or as somebody who's trying to be a soldier for culture, if you're not willing to hear that that you're doing a few things wrong or that there's an area for improvement, then you're not you're not really in it. Then you know, so that has to be, I think, the very first start. And that's one of the ways I've seen people do it is by building these smaller groups where they say, can I just start to get a few people on the floor who are my champions and talk to them and get them to reflect on it and have this. And then they can go and say, you know what? Yeah, I've talked to Ashley. She is in it with us. So let's go. So if you have an issue, you come to me, we'll talk it through. And so getting, it kind of becomes a cascading, a cascading effect where you start with those that smaller group and it can slowly build itself out um, throughout the rest of the organization. I think that's a great point. That's Similar to where you have almost a cohort style of a group at Webco that we're really working on the 2.0 version of our culture. And there's two members of our leadership team in there, myself included, and three people that are basically entry level in our shop. And they sit there and we have they have an equal say to everybody else in that room. And we ask questions and hearing their answers and also their courage to step up and tell us. I really think we need to work on this. Our communication is not great here. We don't feel like everyone's being held accountable in an equal way was um, something that came up in our meeting yesterday, but they feel that they can share that stuff with us, that we're listening. And maybe I can't get up and do something about it tomorrow, but they trust me enough to know that, all right, they're going to put it out there and we're going to make a pathway to eventually fix that. 
And while I may not be proud of the things that come out of that room, I am so proud to, to hear them sharing with us and knowing, knowing that we care and that we want to fix it and that they're on that journey with us. And I think that's, that's a big part of it is we want them, we want them on the team. We want them to take that journey with us. I don't want to be building the culture that I have to shove down everyone's throats. I want them to believe in it and embody it. And I think that it's so important, Amanda, that you say that, that you aren't always, I forget what the word you use, you're not always happy with the things that come out of that room. But then if you had a culture and the fact that it wasn't acceptable to be able to share, it would be so weird to walk out of a room and be like, oh, everything is hunky-dory. Like it, it, it shows your culture and how you guys are working towards stuff that you have these three people that, you know, some of them haven't been there very long and they already feel like they have a say and you're listening to it and it's moving the the you know, the needle forward. And, you know, just going back to how you were talking about, you know, we worked so hard on this culture and then everything happened. And it's almost like it took that back burner. And then the things that are happening now, we, we have to be those hard conversations. And Amanda knows I love hard conversations. I'm very honest. And I, I'm like, okay. So unfortunately, if you're hearing this from more than one person, this is something that you guys have held, that you guys have had, you have allowed, wow, you've allowed to happen. And that we need to take a step back and say, okay, where did this break in the culture come in? Why have we allowed this to happen? Is it one person that's allowing this to happen? Do we need to take a step back and look at that? Is it us as a whole? Is it the company as a whole? So I think that's a big piece too, is the fact that, you know, you can say, this is our culture. This is what we're doing. And kind of going back to the right people in the right seat. That is everybody still on that same page of that. And um, just that leadership piece of it. And I think that when somebody was talking about how, you know, getting that feedback from your employees, going around and asking for that feedback. So I think a lot of times, you know, we give um, reviews, if you give them yearly, whatever, you know, you want to give them your feedback. There should be a spot on there to say, okay, how am I doing as your supervisor? What do you need from me? And it sounds like you guys have it in your culture and the fact of like, how can we help you grow? And that's so key that I think a lot of people just, I'm going to tell you how you're doing, but tell me how I'm doing. This is our time to sit down and let's talk through this. How can we help you? What can we do better? Like be that, you need that two-way communication and set the ground that it's there. There's the platform. Here we have it. And it's not the point that they feel scared or that they're going to be, you know, you've set that expectation and that norm and the fact that you can tell me and I'm going to work on it. I'm not going to be mad at you. I'm not going to cut your hours. I'm not going to do this. You're not going to be, you know, punished for what you told me, but having that two-way communication and, you know, we don't see everything, especially from a leader stand, like a leader side of things. If you're not out on the floor, if you can't, if you're in a small shop, you should be out on the floor, <laughs> at least to say hi at one point in the time, um, you know, that you should be out there, you should know your group and you should just really have that, um, that stuff, but you don't hear everything, you don't see everything. So Monica, I think it's great. We had a, we had a meeting the other day and one of the business leaders that was on there, he was talking about how his company just did a, like a retreat, like a strategic planning retreat. Um, and he owns um, a cabin and apparently also a winery, which I found out. So, <laughs> um, but what he did is, you know, COVID's going on. So what he did instead is he actually invited all of his, like this huge, uh, huge, his, he invited his team of people to come and actually stay at his cabin and at his winery and then brought him into his own home and into the space that was very, you know, kind wow. of private to him. And just the amount of trust and the amount of stories and stuff that was able to come out of that was so important because it was no, um, because now they were in his space, right? He was kind of the one that was, that was out there open and saying, what, what, what's going on? This is who I am. This is really me. I'm a person. So talk to me about what's really happening, which I thought was a very powerful move yes. in terms of being, uh, showing that you're open and transparent and trying to, trying to have this, um, very family focused, you know, come into my house. That's how much I trust you. That's how much I care about you guys. And even that vulnerability, you know, like Amanda said, you know, I just sometimes don't like the stuff that I hear that comes out of it, but being vulnerable enough to be able to take it and be like, okay, now we are going to grow from that. I mean, even in my personal life, when I hear people like Monica, you know, you're like a little this or you're a little that, like any relationship you have, whether it's work, whether it's a friendship, a you know, relationship, whatever. And I'm like, Hmm, you are right. Let me take a step back and reevaluate that. But it's how you take it. You know, it's all. And, you know, we talk a lot about that shifting that mindset. But it's not, it's not about, you know, we're telling you what you're doing wrong. You're doing a million things right. We're trying to help you grow. And this is what's holding you back kind of thing. Definitely trying to get the ego out of people's, out of, <laughs> yeah. out of the room sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and and for us manufacturers, sometimes. <laughs> we take a lot of pride in what we do. 
And as I, and that's the thing is that once you build that trust and once you build that thing that you can just finally just be real with people. And sometimes, you know, I'll just come up and be like, okay, I'm going to be real for a second. And I just lay it out there. I'm not a sugar coder. I'm not, I obviously know who I'm talking to because I've built that rapport and that relationship. But sometimes it's like, okay, your ego has got to go. We need to like come back to the ground and let's, let's work on this because you have 50 people that are counting on you and we can't let this get in the way. So and I do think that is something that, that is very uniquely challenging to manufacturers. We, you know, we build things and we design things. And we take a lot of pride in that. We have a lot of confidence in that. So to go and sit in a room with an engineer and you share about your project and you know the ins and outs of it, you understand everything. It's mechanical, it's, it's factual, it's black and white and it's factual. But then to put them in a room and to hear your employee's voice in a survey where maybe your perception doesn't agree with them. It's a very vulnerable spot and it's very humbling. The first time we did that at Webco, it, humbling is downsizing the way that we felt to see how your employees feel about you in black and white on a projector screen. <laughs> it, well, it really legitimizes it. We knew a lot of those things already, but when you throw them up on the writing on the wall and you have to look at it, you're, you feel as if you failed you failed in creating a culture, you, you failed your team and you kind of just have to sit there in that really vulnerable spot for a minute and be like, all right, we're going to go, we're going to fix this. We're going to start from scratch and, and build something up that it, we can be proud of. Yeah. And I think that, so it's so to hear you say that. So obviously we came in and did this survey and I mean, Amanda, I, I think she wanted to fall out of her chair because this is really the first time in 30 years that we've, that you guys have really like sat down and been like, give it to us. It was anonymous. We, we let them know it was anonymous. It was a paper survey. I was the one that gave them to them as a third party. I was the one that took them from them. Like it was anonymous and we had amazing feedback. And I'm like, your employees want to be heard. It was so amazing to me. And then it's, so this is going back to the culture piece and the fact of the little bit of time, cause we did the survey pretty, pretty early in the relationship. And, you know, I was not, I wasn't surprised on what I saw just with working with other companies and just those few tours, just those few times of seeing people, people, I read people like people's body language, people's how they answer to things, how they respond when somebody else is talking. And I was just like, so this goes back to that part where I was going with this is this goes back to the part of if you bring somebody in and you're giving them a tour because you want to onboard them, they're seeing what I just saw. So it's not, it doesn't take, I mean, granted, maybe I see more just because of what I'm in, like the workforce part of side, the counseling part of that side, like I see probably more. I pick up on things that people don't pick up on, but if I'm seeing it as a third person party that might not even know your company, somebody coming in, if they're picking up on any of that, that could turn them away. So before we end, because we're getting about 15 minutes to ending time, I want to make sure that we're leaving the people that joined us and the people that will see this later, some actionable ways that they can really increase their culture and help empower their people. So Rachel, I'm going to put you back in the hot seat for a minute. You can go first. What, what would you give as two tips that you've seen either at First Resource or what you're doing with the AMBA? Well, so, you know, throughout this whole webinar, we've talked a lot about employee buy-in, employee empowerment, um, and we've, we've talked a lot about how people relate to one another and, and hearing where people are coming from. So I think that if, you know, if you're a leader at your company or in your department, or even if, even if you're not, asking people questions and just listening is a great place to start. It sounds so simple. Um, I'm terrible at it. <laughs> I get teased at my company for how many words I have all the time. Um, but then the other, the other difficult part for me is that I am not a chit chatter. Amanda, I was literally telling Troy yesterday, half of our office was out and all the people who are usually up for the chit chat. So then the rest of the people kept lurking by my office and they're like, Hey, Rachel. So how's it going? And I was like, no, no, you need to. <laughs> so, so that's something that, you know, I, I know that I need to work on, but I also know how much it means to me. The other thing I think is being transparent if, as a leader about where your company is going and what the priorities are and asking every one of your, or communicating that to each of your employees in an individual way and saying, do you have any ideas about how we can get there? Or are you excited about your part in the process? Or 
How do you feel about your part in the process? Do you want more responsibility? Are you feeling overloaded? How do you feel about this? So asking your, asking your employees personal questions, but also giving them that transparency so that they feel like they're, they're a part of everything that's happening. That, that alone will have a huge impact on, on not just your, your culture, but also what, what is successful in your company environment. I love that. Asking and listening. The, the most important part there probably being the second one, the listening. <laughs> All right, Ashley, what would your two tips be? Um, I mean, they're going to echo a lot of what we've already talked about and what Rachel said. I mean, I think first and foremost is, um, is, is having that, is to figure out where you are now. And so whether that is through going up to people and talking to them individually or, you know, having your own employee survey or having a third party like Monica or um, someone else do the third party survey for you, find out where you are because you might be sitting in your seat saying, everything is great. I'm a perfect communicator. We have you have no really workplace drama. There's everybody leaves with a smile on their face. No one's ever, you know, sat in the parking lot and cried before coming to my doors. Everything is great. That you may be surprised to find out or uncover what's behind that. So I think that finding out just first and foremost where you're where you are realistically. Um, and then once you have that, um, obviously, like I said, you're kind of putting your ego to the side and really just soaking that in and letting it and understand that you have a responsibility that people are gonna spend so much time in your building. And so much time working for you every single day that you have a responsibility to them to make sure that they, that those eight hours that they spend there are positive for them. And that, you know, you, that, that way they go home and they can have a positive experience with their family and their friends and they can, um, and that can be trickling down over and over again. Um, and then I would say the second piece, which maybe is maybe kind of goes along the same lines is just letting people sharing your vision and letting people know you care about them. I think that it's very surprising. Um, Gallup has a 12 questions to ask your employees survey. And one of them is, one of the questions is, is, is there someone at work who you think genuinely cares about you and how important that is? And so letting people know that you do care about them, you know, you might not have time to talk to them for an hour and a half every single day, but going out of your way to, you know, offer options for flexibility or just listening to their problems or taking time to ask them, how was your weekend? How was your day? Um, showing people that you care, I think it's going to go a much longer way than what, um, and it's really easy to get pushed aside, right? Because you get focused on your inbox and your fires and your own things, um, that it's really easy to forget about the people who are getting the work done and making sure that they're okay and that they're making it through and that they, that you, they know that you care about them. So I guess those are my two, my two uh, tips, I guess. I love it. Good stuff. Wow. Hmm. <laughs> so, I, yeah, so everything that was already said, and I think one big thing is um, when we think of culture, we think of, I, I want to, I'm trying to think of how I want to word this, but I think it's really important. And I think that people mean to do this, but people don't do this sometimes. So I think having a culture that is inclusive to everybody. So everybody's voice is heard everybody feels like they're invited to the table. Everybody feels that they're just as important as the other person, no matter what you bring to the table, because you all contribute something. So I think having that inclusive culture, and I, and I do mean that even by, you know, if somebody looks different than you, if somebody speaks different than you, if somebody thinks different than you, that you have that culture that you accept and that everybody still feels comfortable and respected. So I think a big thing right now is, you know, um, you know, racial inclusion, age inclusion, gender inclusion, you know, uh, religion, uh, political parties, things like that. There's things that you set as a culture and the fact that like, this is not okay to talk about, but I think at the same time too, that you need to make sure that everybody feels comfortable. And when they come in, they want to be part of it. And they're not like, well, nobody looks like me here or nobody really, I don't feel like I would even fit in. That's one thing you want to make sure that you're creating a culture that anybody could fit in and that you are okay with that. And I think the other piece is, um, really just, I, I think just making sure that everybody's on the same page, you're sending out the same message, the communication piece is that, you know, Amanda, you can think culture is one way, Rachel, you can think it's another way, Ashley, you think it's another way, and I'm telling everybody else it's something else. So I think a big thing too is obviously, I think employer voices, employee voice is like number one, and but that's already been said, but I think just making sure that the, the same message is being sent out because when I'm undermining Amanda because of something like that's not the way that it is. So I think that, again, that goes back to setting that culture and, you know, just putting in and being okay to grow and change and to just be, be vulnerable, be okay with it. 
All right, I'm going to add mine too because you know it is my webinar, so I'm going to add yeah. mine too. Then. <laughs> I think for the people that are integral in building the culture, the most important thing to not forget is to power yourself up before you go into your workplace. Because if you showed up drained, tired, and you don't want to be there, it is going to take an instant reflection on your culture and everyone is going to see it and experience it. And I'm saying that from a very personal COVID world uh, spot but also to not be afraid to make mistakes when you're building your culture and to own up to them. Just because you're a leader and you're leading that culture initiative doesn't mean that you don't get the opportunity to make mistakes and to learn and to have a continuous improvement journey in your culture. They go right along together and we're going to make mistakes. We might make the wrong decision building it, realizing we need to change this area or we should have maybe heard this opinion and incorporated some of that. It's Building your culture is one of the most vulnerable things you're going to do. And it takes humility and vulnerability and being able to own up to your mistakes to do it. And right. those, those would be my, my big two. They're not easy, but. Can I add something else? I, you just hit a good point that I want to, I think about too, um, just from my perspective, but you're human too. So I think that allowing people to be human, to be who they are. So and I, this is one big thing I say to employers when I'm working with culture, job quality, things like that, is that your employees aren't robots. We understand they're there to do a job, but they have other things going on around them. So if you have one, and that's why I say in your culture, you need to get to know your people because as a supervisor, I'm like, man, that person just seems really off today. Have that relationship with them to check in on them and be like, hey, are you good? Like allow them to be human still allow them to be like man I just had a really crappy night like my water heater broke I don't know how I'm going to do this so even just knowing people are human we have problems it's Maslow's hierarchy of need if your basic needs aren't met you can't be your 100% self so I think having that culture and the fact that you're embracing everybody as humans and treating us as that too that's great thank you for adding that I like that so thank you so much ladies I appreciate it thank you to the couple that joined us on the chat and we're going to be posting this on our webco website it'll be online if monica rachel ashley or i can be of any help to anyone please reach out to us all the information is on linkedin and all of our channels thank you so much guys thank you for thank having you. us thank you bye bye